Lord, may we remember that everything that we enjoy in this life and everything that is good is a perfect gift from you. Amen. I bet you could have, should have, we all have a rather long list. I just wanted to start this morning thinking about some of those things. So we'll start with this question. <clears throat> have you ever been in a physical fight? Well, I have. It wasn't like last year or anything. <laughs> it was in my, during my fifth and sixth grade years, I was in three different physical altercations. My record is one, one, and one. <laughs> the one that I won, I'm just, I'm just calling it for me. <laughs> I, no, there was no official uh, declaration. I'm just saying I won that one. The one that was a tie or a draw, neither one of us really wanted to fight, and the principal got there just in time. We both sort of saved face, you know. That's important in fighting. <clears throat> the loss, well, it went a little bit like this. So in fifth grade, I moved to another town, and so south, about 30 minutes, so I was starting a new school year, and I rode a bus to school. Now, many of us probably did. Some know, but I rode a bus to school. I had to walk, not through the snow, over the mountains, et cetera, et cetera, but I walked a good little piece to Summit Elementary School where I caught bus three. And I rode bus three <clears throat> to Higgins Middle School. Now, <clears throat> when I got to the middle school, or sixth grade, they gave me some choices of electives. They went like this. Everybody took, like, drawing art, like art. Then you had to choose between theater arts, choir, or band. Well, I was not going to do the theater arts just because I don't want to role play. I hate that, any of that. I wasn't going to sing. I don't know why I did. I guess I thought band was for me, so I chose band. But then I had the next choice, which is what instrument to play. And so <clears throat> I didn't want to be up front. I'm not going to be one of those woodwinds people. I'm going to be back here in the back. So I chose drums or percussion. And so I, the next thing that had to happen was my parents had to go down to the local music store and buy my snare drum that was in a pretty chunky case. <clears throat> because it was in a case... I did not have to take it home every day and bring it back uh, the next morning or afternoon and morning. The band director was gracious enough to let us drummers keep our stuff, our, or our drum, actual drums in the back of the band hall, but I kept my drumsticks with me. <clears throat> so this afternoon, driving home on bus three, I'm sitting on the aisle. I'm a pretty puny sixth grader. Across the aisle from me was a not-so-puny high schooler. And I'm playing drums on my leg with my drumsticks. You probably know. if You've seen that, you know, practicing my whatever. Well, he took it upon himself to yank my drumsticks out of my hands. Now, I think I remember asking to get them back. I just think I'm sure I surely did that. But I'm not positive. But I'm positive about what happened next. I lost my mind. And I decided the obvious best choice was to pounce on the high schooler across the aisle, which I did. There was some moment of decision there, and I don't remember the exact second, but in a half second, I found my body. I had him pinned. On the, his back was on those green bus seats. And if you have ever been on a bus or in a confined space where there is a fight, fight you know there is a riot going on. I mean, everybody's like, you know, they're screaming, yelling, all kinds of stuff going on. So I'm sure he had to be shocked that here he is, back, backed by me onto the green seat, this little sixth grader. So in that half second where I got him pinned, 
Of course, there comes the, the other half second <laughs> where he pushed me down on the floor on the aisle in between the seats. So if you've been on a bus, you know the, the, the aisle's not, not wide. And I'm on the floor, and he's on top of me. And everybody's going crazy. And I, this is what actually happened. I, he looked down at me. He said, I'm sorry, and punched me in the face. <laughs> So I had to, you know, get up, walk down the aisle where everybody's yeehawing and, ooh, uh, you know, all that stuff. Take my seat shamefully on my little green seat on the aisle. There was a high school girl. Now, I don't know if you've been in high schools much, but you don't want to fight a high school girl. I'm just telling you right off the bat. <laughs> There's a high school girl who was gracious and compassionate enough to take the sticks out of his hand and hand them to me. That's my loss. I, take, I, I went down for the count on that one, punched to the face. The bus driver's name, I don't know what his name was, but he was a reverend. So everybody called him Rev. It's happened so quick, he couldn't even get the bus pulled over in time. I mean, it was that quick. He just kept on down the road, looking in that mirror up there where they're just looking back and going, <coughs> what's going on? And surely it's not that little puny Miller kid, but oh, yeah. <coughs> At some point when I'm sitting on that seat, I made the decision that, that, was, that I'm, I'm going to commit here, and I'm going to do this, <coughs> which leads me to here. So... Today, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to be really honest with yourself. Do some real self-assessing. And admittedly, I'm going to ask you some questions today that I'm not going to give the answer to. You are the only person that can answer the questions. And you'll hear the questions more than once. Who would you fight for? Or what would you fight for? And I'm not talking about the physical, necessarily, altercation, fisticuffs. I'm talking about defending, go to bat for. Who would you, and I don't mean, I'm talking like all committed. Who would you fight for? What? would you fight for? Our passage today is Acts chapter 2, 36 through 37. I'm going to read it here for you. You've turned to it or it's on your devices, on your phones or tablets or on your, in your hardcover Bible, hard copy. I'm going to start in verse 36. I'm going to go to the end of the chapter. But I don't, this is a familiar passage. So what I don't want you to do is think about doctrines, arguments, or points of contention, or any sort of things that go with this passage. What I want you to do is just listen to the passage, read along with me, and then I want you to, I want, I want you to just, just listen. And here we go. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So without thinking about doctrines, I'm just going, I just forgot my phone. I have to read something off of it. What did you get as the general flavor or sense of the passage? Without thinking about 
the pieces that we pull out sometimes to support something we believe in. Just generally, what do you get as the sense or essence or flavor of this passage? They seem to be all in. They're all in. They're eaten up, consumed with this Jesus and this movement. This is a committed group of people we're reading about. They're all in. I want you to hear me read it. and You can turn to it if you want to. From the message. Now I know the message may be not an official translation. But let's just listen to his explanation of what happens. Just like you would if, if I were going to explain this passage. You listen to me read it please. And there's some phrases that are good. All Israel, know this. There's no longer room for doubt. God made him master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on a cross. Cut to the quick, those who were listening asked Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, brothers, what now should we do? Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises targeted to you and to your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our master God invites. He went on in this vein for a long time, urging them over and over, get out while you can, get out of this sick and stupid culture. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized and were signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles and all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. Now we read these passages, sometimes we read particularly the 42 to the end about sharing everything and having it in common. And we look at it like this sort of utopian society. Unable to be reclaimed. Well, that was super good for them then. If I were to sit here and go, hey, we're going to go sell all of our possessions and we're going to give them to the poor and we're going to go head down to the center of College Station, wherever that might be, and we're going to sing praises to God. My response and your response might be, I, I got to go to work. So let's set aside the idea that we could possibly replicate what we've just read. But let's do not set aside the fact that they were all in. So what would you fight for and who would you fight for? What would you fight for and who would you fight? This all-in idea can be summed up a little bit, or at least we can add to the pile of this question by this question using a phrase from the message. What do you need to do to change? What do you need to change in your life to be all-in? There is a 
movie favorite of mine. It's the man in the iron mask. And that's okay, perfect, thank you. This is a, a picture from that movie, The Man in the Iron Mask, family favorite. This is D'Artagnan, Porthos, Aramis, and Athos. Now, I know we always read that there's three musketeers. Why are we reading about the book? But there's always four. That's a long story. It has to do with the book, but it's four. This is a picture of them in this movie. And without getting into the minutia about the movie, their job is to protect the king. And there's a little switcheroo that goes on between characters that some think this is the king and he had a twin brother, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You might know the story. If you don't, it's not a big deal. But at some point, they have to do this. They're standing around a corner in a the gallows, a jail, a dungeon. And they're sitting back there and they know around the corner the false king and all of his guards are facing down that concrete hallway toward their, in their direction with their muskets. They're around the corner deciding or contemplating what they're going to do. And they're, they're going to at some point, they decide they're going to run around the corner with their swords and head toward the muskets. And they do what is, of course, a familiar thing to you, most likely, at least from cinema movies. They put their swords down, all of them, and they say what you know they're going to say. All for one, one for all. And they make that corner and they start running. This is a picture from that movie where they're running toward the muskets. They're all in. Now, there are a lot of examples from movies about people who are all in. There's also real life examples of people who are all in. But there are also some non-examples. So I thought I'd give you some non-examples. Here's one. If I'm going to an A&M game and I say, I leave after the band plays, you're not all in. <laughs> you're just not. There's this funny gig that this comic does. I'm not a comedian, so I'm not going to be able to pull it off. This guy named Nate Bargatze. He does this little bit where he says, you know, when you're in your 20s or upper teens, 19, 19, you get invited to something. You're all in. You don't ask where it is. You don't care where you're going. You don't care about any details. I'm going. I'm there. I'll go. Then he goes on to say that when you get in your 30s and you go, okay, well, where are we going? How long are we going to be there? And you then go, I think I'll drive. You're not all in. You're already explaining, you're getting, you're getting your escape route planned. That's not all in. <laughs> I'll do that all the time. Well, I'll take my own car. What if I get stuck in there? I want out. I was on campus yesterday walking. I'll go up and walk around the academic plaza where we have Devo. And um, I was there with these freshmen. This is an all in sort of one of our sort of cultural all-ins. These freshmen, three guys walk, and they're clearly freshmen because, well, I'm just sorry, they're freshmen. And so, <laughs> I mean, I can tell. I can tell. I mean, I can tell. And so they're sitting there, and they know the superstition about the century tree. It's right there. Bolton's on the back side. These three guys... Start, of course, the superstition is if you walk in there under, you know, the tree and you're hand in hand, you got somebody with you, that's you're going to be married. That's just, but if you walk under the central tree toward Bolton Hall in the back side, they're on the academic plaza, Saul Rostad side, that you're going to be single. That's it. You're going to be alone. So all three, they're, and they're, they're, you know, yelling and uh, yeah, yeah, we're walking to the, toward the tree, down the sidewalk. They're past Sully. They're headed down toward the sidewalk, to the, through, the, through the tunnel of the limbs, through the tree. And so there's a going. Who's going to go? Well, two of them hang back. They're not going under the tree, under the limbs. But this one guy just keeps going. 
And they're yelling. They're making this big scene. I'm not the only one that notices. They're just, they're just making this big scene. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's your life. Don't do it. You'll always be single. Go. No. He just keeps going all the way through. And he went through and they went, oh, no. You're, you're alone forever. He was all in going under that century. That's a stupid example, but I like that. <laughs> so I went with it. Those are some non-examples of being all in. So I was thinking about different Bible stories where people are all in, people, people we know from reading our Bible. And I was thinking about, now this is going to sound braggadocious to you, perhaps. I don't mean it to be this way. <laughs> but I think I would have gotten out of that boat and tried to walk on water. I just think I would have. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'll just swim. Or they'll, they'll throw me a line and I'll, yeah, I didn't, yeah, I wasn't able to walk after all. I'm just going to get back up in the boat. I know, maybe not. But I might have jumped. I'm, it's just water. I've, I've jumped in water before. Let's go. I might have done that. I, you know, maybe you're thinking, no, no way. Well, okay, we'll hear this one. This is a picture of... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, you're super familiar with the story, but let me read it for you. And that's in Daniel chapter 3. Again, you've heard it, but let's hear it again. Fur furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I've set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image of I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. You're familiar with the general gist. It goes like this in Scripture. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O, God, o King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, this falls into the category of, I might have bowed down. I just might have. But that's a great example of all in, right? Maybe you would have just gone tiptoed into that furnace. I'd like to think that I would not. Let's be honest. Rarely, never have we been asked to bow down to a golden image. So we've not been put on the spot. Most of our all-in or not moments isn't even as public as the century tree. Most of our all-in or not moments, we're, the, we're really the only one that knows. Now, maybe our spouse knows. Maybe our family knows. Perhaps a work associate an accountability partner, but most of our all-in moments are just us. So what would you fight for? Who would you fight for? What do you need to change so you can be all-in in your more private moments. Now, maybe if we were in a situation where the crowd's watching us, you know, and the pressure is on, and my children are there, and is dad going to bow down or not? I might have bowed down. But I mean, again, that just doesn't happen, generally speaking. But we still have to answer the question are we all in or not? And what do we need? 
to change. I was thinking about the seniors who are in here. You know, whenever it's, it really goes, it's Happy New Year, by the way, those of us who live by the rhythm of the school, whether it's our own school or a school in the town that we live, this is the new year. And so it's always so sort of this new beginning. And I know those new beginnings. People are like, yeah, I'm going to start. I'm going to start hard, fast. I'm going to get after it. Whether it's studies, church, relationships, new friends, whatever, right at the beginning, I'm, I'm all in. So the question I'm going to address you seniors who we ask to lead by example. You got 40 weeks until your time here is done. What do you need to do to be all in before you head off? 40 weeks for zero to the middle of May. For all of us, the questions are still fair and deserve answers. Again, I told you, you're the only one that can answer. What would you fight for? Who would you fight for? Are you all in? What do you need to change to be all in? What do you need to change to be all in? All in. Let's pray. So, Father, first of all, we thank you that you allow us in your presence. We thank you for your word that instructs us, encourages us, convicts us. We thank you for those great stories of people's lives in the, ba- in, in the Bible where they are all in. They, they are given it all. They're put on the spot, and the decision is yes. That's something I'll fight for. Pray, Father, that you will bless us and compel us by the Holy Spirit to examine, to self-assess, to commit, to change, and we all have something to change where we can be all in. In Jesus we pray, amen.